very robust discussion. We are honored to have Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth joining us today for the panel. And I want to personally thank Senator Duckworth for being here today. We look forward to hearing from the Senator and the other distinguished panelists we have today. Now, I would like to welcome Leora Hudak, a lecturer at the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, who will moderate today's discussion. Leora is a licensed clinical social worker and staff well-being and mental health specialist at the Center for Victims of Torture, where she focuses on Latin America and the U.S.-Mexico border region. She teaches a course about clinical practice with survivors of torture and political violence, and is the field consultant to the Global Social Development Practice Program at the School of Social Administration. Please welcome Leora. Thank you, Provost Lee and Associate Provost Collier. I'm delighted to welcome Senator Duckworth and all of our distinguished panelists, who I will have the opportunity to introduce in a moment. Deportation of U.S. veterans is an issue that has been largely invisible to the public eye. Service in the military provides a pathway to citizenship. However, when service members return to the United States as veterans, the pathway to citizenship is neither automatic or straightforward. At a time when veterans should be able to focus on the challenging tasks of reintegration to U.S. society, reconnecting with family, and healing mind, body, and spirit from their experiences during service, they may find themselves navigating the complexities of our U.S. immigration system. As you will certainly learn from our panelists today, there are many circumstances that can lead a non-citizen U.S. veteran to face deportation. I will do my best to raise questions and discussion to allow our experts here to bring voice to these experiences. What I'd like to briefly bring to your attention are the potential psychological and social consequences of deportation on our veteran residents in order to raise awareness on why this should be considered a significant concern. Military service can contribute to mental health concerns, most common of which are PTSD, depression, grief, and moral injury, among others. Veterans may be eligible to receive care through the VA and other veteran serving programs in the US. However, when a veteran is deported from the United States, the circumstances that they face have the potential to exacerbate mental health concerns and present a significant barrier to accessing care. When facing deportation, an individual's social stability is upended. They may find themselves deported to a country or community that they do not know, are separated from family, navigating complex new environments, and may be in indefinite legal limbo. When veterans return from service, we often speak of a post, right, post-traumatic stress disorder. However, when a veteran is in a new and unfamiliar environment, far from family and community, we can no longer speak of post-traumatic consequences. We're speaking of ongoing and continuous traumatic stress. Individuals facing deportation also confront complex and often ambiguous losses that they may not be able to adequately grieve. Some examples of this may be the loss of family and community, separation from a community of veterans, a loss in the belief that no man is left behind. And in addition to these new psychological concerns, they face significant barriers to accessing care and support they deserve. Depending on the country they are deported to, they may have no access at all. I raise these issues and concerns with you today to illuminate the consequences of these deportations. At a time when veterans should receive the highest level of care, their circumstances may be worsened and they may find themselves further from the family, medical, psychological, and social supports that are needed. With all of this said, it's been my honor over the last few months to deepen my understanding of the leadership demonstrated by our panelists present today to both respond to the immediate needs um, in the social, medical, and psychological domains of veterans living as deported outside of the United States, and to advocate for an end to the harmful practice of deporting veterans. I hope this conversation today will deepen our collective understanding of the intersections between immigration law, 
criminal justice, social services, and military service. And I hope it will emphasize to each of you the need for a coordinated response. Okay. It's my pleasure now to introduce our panelists to you. First is Dr. Alfredo Gonzalez. Dr. Alfredo is an assistant professor of Chicana and Chicano studies at California State University, Dominguez Hills. Dr. Gonzalez received his BA in political science from the University of California, Los Angeles in 2011 and an MA and PhD in political science from the University of Chicago in 2019. His book manuscript is entitled Deporting Veterans, Race, Citizenship, and Non-Citizen Service Members in the Modern U.S. Military. The manuscript explores the historical transactional development of exchanging legal citizenship to immigrants that provide their service in the U.S. military, otherwise known as citizenship for service. Dr. Gonzalez is a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps Infantry and served in Operation Iraqi Freedom from 2003 to 2007. Welcome, Dr. Gonzalez. Next, we have Carlos Luna. Carlos was born in Mexico City, Mexico. He served in the US Navy from 2004 to 2009 as an aviation electronics technician. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree in industrial and organizational psychology from DePaul University, Chicago in 2012. After this, he worked as a mental health professional with at-risk youth. He went on to earn a Master's of Arts degree in Community Psychology from DePaul University, Chicago in, in July, or I'm sorry, in June of 2016. He's a certified peer support specialist through the, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance and a certified uh, veteran service officer through the National Association of County Veteran Service Officers. In 2017, Mr. Luna uh, co-founded the only trauma-informed peer support program for veterans detained in the Cook County Department of Corrections in Chicago. He serves as president of a Chicago-based council of the League of United Latin American Citizens, Green Card Veterans, to influence appropriate policy by changing the narrative regarding non-citizen U.S. service members, veterans, and their families exiled through deportation. Welcome, Carlos. Up next, we have Miguel Perez, who is an Army veteran who served two tours in Afghanistan and had been in the U.S. since age eight. He has been deported to Mexico um, because of a 2008 felony conviction. He says he mistakenly believed he became a U.S. citizen when he took an oath to protect the nation. Miguel was taken into custody by Immigration and Customs Enforcement Officers, or ICE, after he served half of a 15-year prison sentence for a nonviolent drug charge. Thank you for being with us today, Miguel. Next, Thank we you. have Thank Edward you. Barajas, who was a deported veteran who was granted full pardon in 2017 by California Governor Jerry Brown. Hector enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1995, served in the 82nd Airborne, and was honorably discharged in 2001. In 2002, he pleaded no contest to a felony conviction. After serving his sentence and another year in detention, he was deported to Tijuana, Mexico in 2005. While in exile, he founded The Bunker, which is a deported veteran support house, which provides housing, social services, and access to legal service net networks for deported veterans. We're so honored to have you here today. And finally, um, we're honored to welcome U.S. Senator Tammy, Tammy Duckworth, who will join us in just a moment. Um, Senator Duckworth is a U.S. Army veteran and Purple Heart recipient who retired at the, at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in 2014. She previously served as Congresswoman for Illinois' 8th Congress Congressional District, as the Assistant Director of Veterans Affairs and Director for the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs. As Director of the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs, she helped create a tax credit for employers that hire veterans, establish a first-in-the-nation 24-7 veterans crisis hotline, and helped develop innovative, pro innovative programs to improve veterans' access to housing and health care. 
In 2009, President Obama appointed Senator Duckworth as the Assistant Secretary of Veterans Affairs, where she coordinated a joint initiative with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to help end veterans' homelessness, work to address the unique challenges faced by female as well as Native American veterans, and created the Office of Online Communications to improve the VA's accessibility, especially among young veterans. In 2019, Senator Duckworth reintroduced three bills to protect and support veterans and service members. They were the Veterans Visa Protection Act, the HOPE Act, and the IVETS Act. This legislation would prohibit the deportation of veterans who are not violent offenders, give legal permanent residents a path to citizenship through military service, and strengthen VA healthcare services for veterans. She had also supported legislation to protect undocumented family members of, and members of the U.S. Armed Forces, as well as legislation that would facilitate access to all steps of the naturalization process for deported veterans. We're so honored to have Senator Duckworth join us today. And finally, I'd like to introduce John Hojek, who is a second year student at the um, University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration and a U.S. Marine Corps veteran. He will serve as today's MC when we get to the question and answer session. John is currently interning at Rush Medical Road Home Program for Veterans, as well as with the San Francisco Veterans Health Administration. Please join me in welcoming all of our panelists today. Wonderful. At this point, we're going to transition to the questions that we have for our panelists. And the first question that we have is for Carlos Luna. And Carlos, the question we have for you is, why did you start the Green Card Veterans and what specific changes are you working to advance? Thank you for that. And uh, thank you to the university uh, for hosting this important discussion. Um, and thank you to the Senator for joining us in it as well. Um, why Green Card Veterans started? was because um, at the time I had been working with veterans that were incarcerated at the Cook County Jail and we really recognized uh, that uh, detention as a opportunity for intervention. And as we were uh, working with that, we came upon the story of Miguel Perez, who uh, was facing deportation uh, for a um, drug offense. Uh, it did not uh, take my team and I uh, much debate uh, to advocate for this man. Uh, we didn't see much in regards to any veteran uh, uh, subject matter experts or anybody with experience who was doing so. Uh, so we uh, did so. Uh, you know, Green Card Veterans is, I, I wish I can say it was an organization that was well-funded and that was... Um, uh, having a, um, a large amount of resources behind it. Um, but the fact is, is that we are a Chicago-based uh, council of a national civil rights organization. Uh, we are veterans. We are veteran family members. We are Gold Star Mothers. Uh, and we are just community allies who um, understood that this was wrong and we needed to do something. Um, that has allowed for us to uh, utilize our um, networks in other membership-based organizations like the American Legion, the VFW, uh, LULAC, to pass resolutions within the organizations uh, that demonstrate support for addressing this. Uh, we've been able to take those resolutions um, to the city of Chicago, Cook County, the state of Illinois, for example, uh, to demonstrate at the federal level that it's not just a small group of community members who care about this, but it's really the membership of all of these organizations. And, and in our case with Miguel, it was the people of Illinois who were voting to um, stop his deportation in what way they could at the state city levels. Um, we, uh, again, like I said, we're not, um, we are professionals in different domains, but not necessarily the ones that uh, are necessary here. Um, so what we've um, focused on is having to change the narrative. 
um, when I and others started working with veterans in the Cook County Jail, for example, uh, it was our experience that uh, other veteran organizations, uh, national and local, uh, were not necessarily on board with helping at that point in their life. It was more, well, have them come and talk to us when they get out of jail. And really, in our opinion, uh, that was missing the opportunity to have an effective intervention. Uh, they needed the help when they're at the lowest, and many times the lowest is at that jail. So um, to some, I think that uh, we began Green Card Veterans, and I say we because there was 13 of us who did so, uh, because we needed to do something to try to stop this deportation uh, of this veteran. And we hung in there because we realized how many more there were and it is in our nature uh, to really, like you said before, not to leave someone behind. Thank you so much, Carlos, um, for that background on Green Card Veterans. And you, you mentioned Miguel as being really central to um, the, the starting of Green Card Veterans. Miguel, I'm wondering um, if you can tell us a bit about your experience. You were deported and re repatriated. What was that process like? What was the impact on you and your family? Okay, thank you for that. I wish the answer to that question was a simple one, but uh, being deported was actually a very long process that began before anybody at USCIS or ICE knew who I was. My military experience in Afghanistan and life after returning was full of experiences that all together led to my deportation. Um, I was discharged from the military on August 20th, 2004. And once I got back to Chicago, my priorities was just to get a job and provide for my family, survive. Um, and honestly, I was pretty much homeless. I was staying at my sister's house. And uh, and then my girlfriend at the time became pregnant with my second child. And it was a struggle just to go to the stores or being stuck in traffic. I mean, I suffered from anxiety attacks, panic attacks, just by being stuck in traffic. I would have to go do my grocery shopping at night to minimize attacks. I was... um paranoid, confused. I couldn't seem to make any decisions at work or in life generally. After the military, I had on three jobs. Uh, the first one was a warehouse doing logistics and it was very difficult to maintain because I was still going at the pace of war. You know, I would do the job of three people in, in three hours and my mom would tell me, well, you don't have to come back tomorrow. You know, it, it's done. And uh, uh, that was for all three jobs. I was a uh, I was a crane contractor for the BNSF Railroad, and it was the same problems over and over and over. Um, my friends would describe me to be like snapping that I, that I would do when I was blacked up drunk, pretty much. And uh, it wasn't until friends and my family directed to me to the VA when they saw me at my lowest. But that, that was just a whole different experience. I was at the VA hospital, and from the very first time that I went to Heinz, uh, the hospital did not look very welcoming. It looked like a retirement home that was under construction. One young lady told me that it had been more than two years since my discharge, but they set me up with an appointment anyway. At that time, uh, many of us who were discharged were eligible for two years of medical benefits, but nobody told me or other people that I know about it when we were leaving the military. Uh, I went to see a, a VSO, a veteran service officer, who became, uh, he started the, the claims process for me. And I went to a few of the appointments that scheduled me, but by that time, I had already begun to let my negative coping get the best of me. I was unable to sleep or tolerate being around other people. I could not stand in line at the grocery store. I could not be anywhere. Traffic, I mean, it caused me to be unable to work and be, you know, it was just, I don't know what I was going through. I mean, now I know. The only times that I felt comfortable were the times when I was intoxicated. And I'm aware of what people have said about my conviction of having uh, large amounts of cocaine, but if it, if I had an attorney that wasn't interested in just keeping the bail money, that would have been a whole different case. Even uh, when I was arrested, the men who the DEA and Chicago police have been investigating for drug trafficking was a person I knew from around the neighborhood. And uh, I'm not sure what amounts he had been trafficking, but I was getting small amounts from him to give me by to la. So he asked me to go on a, on a ride with him to go drop something out. 
I had an idea. I, I knew what was in the bag, but I also knew better than to ask. And um, all that was on my mind was just to party myself, to go numb, so I didn't have to deal with anything else. And uh, ultimately, I found myself facing 30 years in state prison for things that, that they had been investigating somebody else for doing. And that person was under investigation. He uh, he fled, he skipped bail, and he was murdered in Mexico. So I had no co-defendant. And the criminal defense attorney that I had uh, told me that I had an easier time pleading 15 years than to risk a trial and getting 30 years. And remember, I did not have an easy time making good decisions. And now I got this attorney telling me that I should plead guilty and get it over with. So I plead guilty to due to his uh, not representing me the right way. And uh, once I got into state prison, all the treatment that I couldn't get on the streets was being offered, which was it was weird for me. I had programs where I could speak to others uh, going through the same things as me. I had my medication. I had monitoring. Uh, I was comfortable in my own skin. And it's a shame that I was still in prison, but I had motivation to get up in the morning and continue you know, fighting to live another day. But um, about a year before I was to be released from prison, that's when I got a notice from uh, ICE that I was going to be deported instead of going home because I was a legal permanent resident and not a citizen. Uh, I couldn't understand that. I was like, wait, I thought everything was fixed in the military. So I spent nearly two years in ICE detention where they were painting me out to be a drug dealer, like, like the character Scarface, I guess. And all of the defense work that the criminal attorney didn't do it was now being done in front of an immigration attorney and by uh by green card veterans my family and the community but uh they weren't interested in hearing any of it they were just judging me for my mistake the criminal mistake and not the the immigration part of it uh, when they finally did uh remove me it became clear that the only way of being repatriated was to somehow undo the criminal conviction that had done so uh, in this case, it was just post-conviction relief that helped me out. And Miguel, you mentioned that um, that you received that notice from ICE and believed um, and found out at that point that you were still a legal permanent resident and not a citizen. What do you think was the uh, what happened there? Why um, why was the misunderstanding um, about your um, immigration status? Why did that come up? Um, because, uh, uh, because of that same reason that I was a legal permanent resident and not a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. So being convicted of a felony, uh, makes you automatic, uh, to be deported or not automatic, but then you're already on ice radar and, and now you're a target and now you're, uh, you're waiting just to uh, get picked up by ice. Uh, I had a, um, I kept sending letters to ICE and to uh, USCIS about it after I found out, and they they didn't even really know. Like we did not know where the where it happened, but I guess during the process they put a immigration hold that I wasn't aware of until like a year before that. So it sounds like a lot of things that were going on behind the scenes with your immigration status and immigration process that you weren't always um, totally made aware of. Uh, um, yes, absolutely. Uh, the first time that I saw an immigration judge, I was still in prison, and I saw him through a through a video, um, through a video court thing, and that judge did not want him to deport me. When he found out, he said, "No, um, I don't see why he should be deported. He was in the military, so he gave everything back to ICE." And so USCIS and said, I'll take this to somebody higher than you because I'm not deporting this person and I'm not going to keep. So even the immigration judge was like, what's going on here? Thank you so much for that. I, I want to go to Dr. Gonzalez um, because your research explores this phenomenon of, of non-citizen service members as uh, non-traditional immigrants. Can you elaborate a little bit on your findings, um, some of the things that you explored in your research and the implications for U.S. immigration policy? Uh, shed a little light on why some of these things are happening for us. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you so much to all the distinguished panelists. I think this is a really important conversation that, that we need to keep on having. Um, I call immigrant service members uh, non-traditional immigrants because 
they're essentially uh, assuming the burdens of a citizen without a guarantee to citizenship and and not having a guarantee to citizenship has been something that the u.s has practiced since before world war ii so world war one was the last time that folks immigrants could join the military um, and become naturalized almost in the same day but prior to world war ii we get to a different type of system uh, that's based off of racism and exclusion that now folks have to serve at least three years before they could apply for naturalization. And then that allows the opportunity for people to be denied for naturalization. And so we haven't changed that uh, since 1940. So since the 1940 Nationality Act. Um, and, and it's been reproduced and reaffirmed in the 1952 Immigration and Nationality Act. And that that's the law that we continue to refer back to whenever we're talking about expediting uh, naturalization processes. However, uh, an, exp an expeditious process to naturalization does not guarantee folks will actually become naturalized. And so this idea that people have to serve either three years or one year, depending on whether we're on peacetime or wartime, has been normalized since 1940. And so this, this whole system uh, hasn't been changed or remedied since the 1940 Nationality Act. And now we drift off into different policy areas like criminal law uh, because we haven't remedied these laws. So, so now we have a situation where immigrant service members are actually serving in a segregated military because they lack legal citizenship they are also occupationally stratified. So that means that they could only enter certain occupations. So immigrant service members uh, are allowed to serve uh, at least 20 years, but only in the Marine Corps. So in other, in other military branches, immigrant service members, like for instance, the Air Force, can't continue re-enlisting past their eighth year of service unless they become naturalized citizen. So what we have is a system where uh, an expedited process to naturalization is being introduced to immigrants as a benefit. However, it's completely removed from, from any aspect of service. And so, so it's, it's thought of as separate, right? Yet it's used to entice people to come and serve their country. However, for a lot of immigrants that serve in the military, uh, uh, the people that I've talked to, citizenship seems to be a secondary concern. For a lot of these folks, they really just want to serve their country, and especially um, the folks that were brought to the U.S. as children. This is the only country that they know. So, so citizenship for a lot of them isn't something that they're thinking about when they're enlisting. However, it is something that they believe they have already earned, right? Um, so right now what we're experiencing is a system of inclusionary hedging. And what I mean by hedging is that the U.S. continues to gauge the risk of incorporating immigrants who serve in the military by putting on these uh, time and service requirements, and that we haven't changed since 1940. So now, um, what we're seeing is that these policies have drifted off into different domains like criminal law and immigration law. So we need to address these time and service requirements because they're normalized now as if as if this is the only way that we can include immigrants that serve in the military. And so what we're seeing is that folks that aren't able to naturalize in the military for one reason or another. So for instance, uh, when the invasion of Iraq started, folks weren't able to naturalize overseas until 2008. 
So, and, and so you needed to naturalize in the US in order to make that happen. So imagine folks that are fighting overseas, trying to get their naturalization applications approved, yet they have to do their interviews in the US. And, and so folks were doing two, three deployments without being recognized as political members of society. Uh, so, so one of the things that we can do is to stop this uh, from happening is to make uh, immigrant service members into U.S. nationals. If this question of political rights still hasn't been resolved, because they should at least be recognized as members of the country with civil rights. And I want to follow up with that just for a moment with you. You mentioned addressing the time and service requirements, uh, making immigrant service me members into nationals. Are there other key areas that you would identify from your research that we can begin to address? Uh, on top of what, what's happening with uh, immigrant service members. Uh, so, so one of the things that the U.S. has historically done that we haven't really highlighted or we don't really talk about is that the U.S. has engaged uh, in a somewhat of a, a foreign legion. And, and this actually happened with Senator Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. Um, in the late 1940s and, and with the Lodge Act of 1950, where the U.S. was specifically recruiting folks from Eastern Europe to come to the U.S., joined the army, and after five years, uh, gained citizenship, and over 2,500 Eastern Europeans were able to successfully become U.S. citizens after their service. Um, so what we're seeing is a disconnect between whether the service that immigrants are performing is sufficient to gain political rights. And that's a question that Congress has to resolve. As service members, I think they should at least be given civil rights for the work they have done on behalf of the nation. And that is to live in the country unrestricted. Thank you so much. Um, and at that, so it's a great segue to welcoming our U.S. Senator Tammy, Tammy Duckworth to our panel today. And, and Senator Duckworth, um, I want to invite you into the conversation and ask you um, a bit about your perspective. You bring two important perspectives to this panel today, your own military service and your own history being born and raised internationally. Um, how has your experience informed your work to address veterans issues and especially, especially this topic of deported veterans? Well, it's so good to be on. Thank you, everyone. Special shout out to Carlos Luna out there who's been doing a lot of work uh, for a long time. Um, uh, well, there, you know, I, my own military service really allowed me to gain an understanding of the contributions of our, fam our, memory, our military men and women who are immigrants, who are uh, uh you know, able to speak various languages who are cultural experts in many ways and, and that they bring a real unique uh, um, skill set to the table. And having grown up overseas as someone, you know, although I'm, I was born in America because of my American father, um, my mother, I didn't speak, I didn't speak English till I was eight. So I spoke Thai as my primary language. I grew up overseas and my mother didn't, you know, speak very good English at all. Um, and I found myself as a child, like many immigrant children, um, translating for her parents. Um, and, and I learned, I really understood the importance of language. And so for me, those two things came together. And I think that we as a nation are missing out on a skill set on a group of people who could really help our military become stronger and more able to interact on a global scale and help strengthen our position as a global leader. Um, in that, in security and, and, and defense. And that, it, and so it, 
you know, boggles the mind to me that why we wouldn't welcome immigrants into the military and, and provide them with citizenship. This is why I've actually written a piece of legislation called the Enlist Act. I did this when I was in the House um, and uh, got some support across the aisle, um, but it was shelved um, under Speaker Boehner. And, and I'm going to try to bring it back up again in this next Congress under um, uh, President Biden. It would provide, as as I was just mentioned, um, a green card, a resident status, as soon as you enlist in the military. Um, and then, you know what, hang on. My, I just realized that my battery and my iPad is not hooked up and it just gave me a battery low. So I don't want to like drop off in the middle of this conversation. Um, and it, it, would, it would provide a citizen's um, citizenship after one full term of enlistment if you served honorably. So you would get legal civil status immediately um, and then you would actually um, get your citizenship once you complete your um, your service. And I think that that's reasonable. And I think most veterans uh, uh, support that and, and most immigrants would support that as well. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Senator Duckworth. I want to I want to bring another personal story into the conversation at this time too, um, and invite uh, Hector to speak a little bit about your experience. Um, you were also deported and repatriated, um, and and some of your experiences um, have shaped. I understand have shaped your views on on U.S. citizenship. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences and and some of the perspectives that you have now about being an immigrant, about obtaining citizenship? Sure. Um, can you guys hear me? Am I good? Okay. Uh, well, basically, one of the things that happened. Uh, I served in the uh, U.S. military. Uh, I came here as a as a young child. I ended up uh, enlisting at the age of seventeen, and uh, Ended up serving almost six years in the military uh, through uh, with a green card. I uh, served with the 82nd Airborne almost six years. Uh, unfortunately, when you're in the military, there is no program. Nobody helps you uh, uh, do the process of citizenship. And uh, you know, although there is uh, there is a process, one of the things that that we lack in is is somebody uh, helping you. One of your NCOs telling you, "Hey, this is this is the the process." And uh, I've heard many situations where people say, well, you, it's, it's a personal accountability. It's, it's also uh, the accountability of the military as leadership that they should take care of you. It's just like if you were to, uh, you were to sign up for Walmart and you through the 401k program or something like that, somebody should still help you out in, in, in this process. Otherwise, it, I believe your, your rights are be, being violated. And basically what happened to me, me is when I served in the military, I started getting in trouble at some point. I ended up getting uh, processed out in 2001, and uh, but I got honorable discharge, and that those problems continued. I ended up uh, catching a case where I went to prison, and I was ended up being uh, sent to ICE for about a year. Fought my case. Unfortunately, uh, immigration they don't do not appoint uh, counsel for you, so I had to fight my case on my own or pay for an attorney. So I ended up just uh, getting uh, deported after one year of fighting immigration on my own. And I was just tired of, the, of, of, of going through all these legal procedures that I had no idea of what it was. And uh, Alfredo mentioned the, uh, the uh, U.S. nationality uh, argument, and that's something that I actually used. But I had no idea what I was doing because I was uh, just giving like a script. And here you go. This is what you can use it, at, you know, at some point. And uh, I understand it now more. But, you know, it's, it's, you got to have an attorney. you got to have somebody that helps you and assists you in, in, in that process. Uh, so I just went through the legal, the legal procedures and I was just tired and got deported. Um, that was in 2004. I snuck back into the country six months later. And then, um, was it in, uh, about, what is it about? No, June, June, uh, July. And I started a family, started working, uh, for the union, made it all the way to journeyman, uh, ended up getting caught in 2009 and got deported, uh, a second time, um, in 2009, I started looking online and started connecting with other veterans. Uh, so prior to my deportation in 2009, I, I was already learning that there were other people that were being deported. When I was in immigration in 2004, I thought I was, thought I thought I was the only person going through this. Um, through my advocacy and work, I started connecting with different veterans around the world. We have veterans being deported to over 50 countries from all over, all over, their, all over the world, all the way from the Vietnam to the uh, to current Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, some were drafted, uh, and but for the most part, most people had a green card, and um, they were deported because of some 
something criminal or or some people were deported just because they didn't have a they didn't renew their green card um and so it's, it's there's a lot of people there's a lot of different situations um i think that uh the military needs to be held accountable and regardless of what you did you should not be deported i've been to funerals where i'm here in honor of country and, and duty and uh, a flag is given to these to these uh, soldiers families or these veterans families and uh it's 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 uh, there's no honor in that and uh, one of the things that we hope uh, with this new administration happens is that they either do uh, some kind of executive order or also the U use the U.S. nationality um, as well. When you're in the military, you are considered a U.S. national. And at some point, from my understanding, from when, when I was fighting my case, the courts argue that you lose that status once you leave the, uh, once you leave the uh, military. And uh, so... Uh, I'm uh, thankful for Senator, Senator Duckworth and everybody that's, that's uh, pushing this legislation and, and everybody to get him home. But I think we really have an opportunity with this administration uh, to uh, bring back home our deported veterans. And at the very least, the easiest thing that could be done is to definitely uh, stop the deportations. That, 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 that could be an easy fix. Uh, also want to reach out to any universities that deal with the, uh, the, legal, the legal part or volunteer their, their services. We have been able to get home some deported veterans because of some of their work. So if there's any universities that want to get involved and also research as well. So it's very important that that we do these, uh, that we continue to advocate and try to get home our veterans. So that's about, thank you. Thank I you. could go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> so much. Yeah. And Senator Duckworth, I understand you had the opportunity to visit the bunker, which Hector helped to found in, in Tijuana. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and how that shaped some of your policy perspectives? Well, it, it opened my eyes to the range of veterans who have been deported. That was the key thing I learned, you know, the stories of all the veterans who were there. And I want to thank Hector for the work that he did to, to help me come and have that very successful visit. And, and it, I, you know, people have this image, right, uh, uh, um, where the, the deported veterans are, you know, some young guys who got in trouble and now they're being deported, you know. But it's not. It's, I mean, I, I met veterans who, you know, were Korean War veterans who were deported after 50 years, 60 years, and, and you know, cancer, people were suffering from cancer, and we and we still deported them uh, to places where they couldn't possibly get the, uh, the, the treatment that they needed. Um, just the range of experiences from veterans, I mean, and we, we deported veterans for a DUI, you know, this is, this is, I mean, really, for misdemeanors. Um, and so it, it just really opened my mind to the range of um, uh, stories that are out there. And it has, and when I came back, I started writing quite a few more pieces of legislation to address the issue, everything from stopping the deportations of veterans um, uh, who, you know, uh, have nonviolent crimes, um, uh, uh, you know, setting up an immigrant, immigrant veterans eligibility tracking system that would require DHS to, annotate all immigration and nationalization paperwork that this is a veteran who served um, uh, so that that is something that goes with them. Um, I have even worked with DOD. Now the Trump administration um, put a halt to it, but to uh, address this issue that Hector mentioned that we should actually have a representative from the state department, from immigration, uh, from the citizenship office at every single um, a basic training station, every single advanced training station, so that when the troops go through, that is one of the things you're checked for, and that there's a person from the right office to immediately begin your citizenship paperwork right there, and also during your um, deployment and redeployment um, uh, interview, so that that is done, because we have a lot of cases where veterans thought they had, that they were citizens, they thought they had started the paperwork, but the unit never submitted it. Well, you're depending on a unit clerk who, you know, is doing a million other things to push through your paperwork for you. And it just got, the ball just got dropped. And so 10 years later, a guy thinks he's a, he's a citizen. It turns out he's not. Um, and he finds out because he gets a DUI and now he's being deported. That's not right. 
it feels like there's a related question um, here, and I want to I want to bring Carlos back into the conversation too, as somebody with um, some background in mental health and expertise in trauma. Uh, there have been some related questions, as you all have been sharing, about the trauma experiences, the impact of mental health, both on these deportations, but then also as a result of deportations. And I want to invite both the senator and Carlos to comment a little bit on um, your understandings of how mental health comes into the, the picture here. Um, well, let me just do one quick thing really quickly. It's important to understand that a lot of veterans get into trouble even while they're in the military for self-medicating because they are not diagnosed or are discouraged from seeking the mental health um, uh, that they needed. And this really happened uh, all the way through to 2000 and I would say 13, 14 timeframe and make and still continuing. And so you now have guys who get in trouble while they're in the military and get discharged because of a side effect of their service. Um, and so we have to make sure our veterans get diagnosed um, while they're still serving. But also a lot of these deported veterans deserve to be evaluated by the VA um, who could actually backdate and, and say, hey, you know, this veteran has PTSD as a result of his service in 2005. He wasn't deported to 2007. We need to go back and we can change his discharge status. And that will help him fight in order to get his citizenship and, and get back into the country. So that is a very active part of what we need to be doing right now. And, and now shut up and listen to Carlos because he knows way more about this than I do. <laughs> thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, thank you for all the work that you've done on the panels. Um, but you're right. Uh, a lot of what we're seeing in, in the trauma, it's not just trauma that happens while you're in service, right? Um, the definition of uh, disability uh, for compensation is any uh, trauma that had, that in was incurred in service or exacerbated by service. And what we see with uh, the immigrant community is that there is a lot of trauma there. I mean, it's just documented by environmental stressors, right? Um, um, by the, the trajectory uh, that they live in uh, urban settings. We, it's just documented to be more, uh, more trauma there. And it manifests in di many different ways. Uh, Senator, you made a, a great uh, point that there are veterans who have been deported for DUI, right? Not necessarily um, all of them having to do with violent crimes, but there is a range because trauma manifests in many different ways. It can be as uh, something like a DUI, right? And we have uh, uh, veteran treatment courts across the country in different municipalities that uh, were established because of that. Uh, and in many ways, because of, uh, Senator, because of the, the, the veterans who you met in uh, Tijuana from the Korean War, from Vietnam. And I mean, we, we had an opioid epidemic among Vietnam veterans, and it wasn't called that, right? It's only been called that today. Um, so all of these different things that manifest in different points in their lives. Uh, here in Chicago, for example, um, the previous police superintendent, when asked why uh, Chicago police have to uh, wait until they um, uh, uh, have a misfortunate incident with a community member to get help, he said, because it's a macho job. And we see that in our military, as we do out here in, in other professions that are like it. There's a lot of trauma. It, it is often misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, or not diagnosed at all. And we are um, pushed to push ourselves and just to get through the next day. And what we see is a lot of self-medicating uh, with legal substances that, in my opinion, are often more detrimental than the ones that uh, we go after. Uh, we can see uh, just in this election, uh, there were so many more states that decriminalized or legalized recreational uh, cannabis or medical cannabis. Uh, we're seeing that a lot of the um, the the um, fights that we have taken to our communities over the past, uh, we're recognizing that we were wrong. Much of that, uh, um, some of that was addressed in 2014 by Secretary of Defense Hagel when he issued the memo uh, to uh, provide new guidance on Vietnam era veterans uh, um, discharge upgrades because there was a recognition that their 
uh, underdiagnosed and undiagnosed trauma may have had a, uh, a culpatory role in their discharge. And then, of course, uh, we see that when somebody is discharged with less than honorable conditions, however that might be, they uh, their access to a lot of the veteran-centric and more appropriate resources is cut out, right? So uh, I, I'm not sure what the number is today, um, but the number of veterans or people who served in our military that are treated by the VA is below 40 percent, right? And that's just because of different uh, requirements that the VA has. At my work in the community, uh, I see many times having to provide uh, community-based uh, programming to the veterans that are in the jail because, quite frankly, they either do not want to... Um, uh, go to the VA for whatever reason, they might not be ready to, or they just don't qualify for it. So uh, it, it's really, um, you know, like the Senator said earlier, there is an image that people may have when they think of a veteran. But the truth is that veterans come from every corner of this country and just about every corner of the world. Uh, they put on the uniform and their problems, their issues, their needs are about as diverse as the person standing next to them. Thank you so much for that. And and Hector and Miguel, you um, could you speak a little bit to what some of the needs are that you have seen from uh, for yourselves and for other veterans who have been deported while living in exile? Um, what's the? There's been some questions coming in about the access to care. Um, does the VA extend to folks who are living in exile? What are some of the most prominent needs? Sure. As far as uh, get my good. Thank you. Okay. There we go. Um, sure. One of the so there is a. Uh, a program called the Foreign Medical Program that's uh, basically set up for anybody that lives abroad. Uh, but what happens is it's limited. It's uh, uh, you, there's only certain healthcare that you can get, and also you have to be you have to have a disability rating of a certain percentage to have access to that. Um, you can't just walk into the VA like over here and just ask for help. And uh, there's no VA centers, I believe. But there's only in the one in the Philippines, and even still there, it's it's hard to have get access to that. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lack of, uh, and then there's also a lack of awareness about filing for your VA benefits and, and access to VSOs. Uh, a lot of veterans don't know that they need help, you know, and, and that's what happens. And that's why some of these guys get in trouble because they don't, they don't, they don't realize that when they come back from war and they have this trauma that they, uh, you know, they, they have PTSD or they MST or all these different things. Um, there's a lot of needs. There's, you know, the bunker can only do so much, uh, like Cardo said, we're, his organization is not well funded, neither are we. And we're in a sense doing what the government it should be doing, you know, and, and uh, you know, we try to help them out with their VA benefits. Uh, we're doing, uh, we're, this year we're doing a toy drive, a Thanksgiving dinner, but, but you know, the, the most important thing is really the, 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 the uh, getting these guys home also, and also taking care of their, or their, their mental health, because uh, some of these guys are, they're really going through it. And uh, I just want to thank uh, Senator Tammy Delkert for introducing the legislation and, and continuing the conversation. And uh, Carlos brought up uh, some very important points about uh, a lot of the stuff that these guys are getting deported for is, is connected to the military service. And uh, we should definitely continue to treat them and not deport them. Yeah. Yes, and Miguel, I want to invite you back into the conversation, too. What have been some of your observations about the needs and access to care? Um, well, in my experience, the main thing was uh, mental health and medicine, just like uh, uh, Hector just mentioned. There, yes, there's they got the the foreign program, but it's not for for in my situation. I wasn't able to uh, get any of that. Uh, I was just stranded in Mexico with no medication, no mental health, and that's the main thing. I mean, here nowadays, you know, any veteran can go to the VA hospital and get their treatment or, or get an appointment, but uh, but being deported, you lose all that. So you have really nothing. I don't know how the the program works with the foreign that uh, Hector was talking about, but yes, my observation is mental health is is the is the main priority for those that are already deported. 
Thank you. And with our last 15 minutes that we have for the panel discussion, before we turn to question and answer, I want to talk about some solutions um, or, or a way forward for the future. Um, Senator Duckworth, the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force recommended ending the deportation of veterans during the next administration um, without, you know, without outlining a lot of details about what that might look like. How do you plan to carry forward this work at the federal level? And what are some of the actions that local governments and in individuals who might be in our audience today can take to support that. Yeah, I'm mute. I was I was being polite and, and muting myself, but then <laughs> I heard myself there. Um, so first off, what people can do is to reach out to their um, representatives and senators. Um, or have their family members reach out to their representatives and senators and say, you need to support these actions. Um, and I'll tell you some of the things that, that can be done. I've already introduced many of these bills on their own, but they could also be executive actions by the Biden administration as well. So my first one is Veterans Visa and Protection Act of 2019. That bill would prohibit the deportation of veterans who are not violent offenders. That's what I talked about already. And that um, deported veterans may also re-enter the United States as legal permanent residents and then work their way towards becoming naturalized citizens. Um, uh, and it would also extend uh, military and veterans benefits to those who would be eligible if they had they not been deported so that they would actually get those benefits even if they were. The Healthcare Opportunities for Patriots in Exile Act, HOPE, we like, we love, we love acronyms in the Senate on, on the Capitol Hill. But the HOPE Act basically would allow deported veterans who committed nonviolent crimes the opportunity to temporarily come back into the U.S. to receive medical care from the VA and for their service-connected medical conditions and to be evaluated for service-connected medical conditions. So that even if you don't have status, then you can at least get a visa to come in and go to the VA and get the help that you need. Um, also, um, I... Uh, you know, think that we need to be doing several things like um, uh, the Biden administration can actually do many multiple things. There was a program that allowed uh, DACA recipients, for example, to have accelerated citizenship through enlisting in the military. That was halted. Um, uh, and also there was a program um, that was halted by the, the Trump administration. Um, and then also making sure that um, uh, deported veterans who have successfully completed their naturalization process can attain citizenship interviews at a port of entry. We were able to make that happen. Um, but there's a lot of these types of things that are a whole basket of pieces of legislation that I've introduced that could all be executive orders by the president. Um, and I know that they're seriously looking at all of those because there have been some great folks on that committee, on the transition team advising the president-elect. And, and Dr. Gonzalez, can I invite you to weigh in on this too? How are your, what are your thoughts about what we can do to address the issue? And as a University of Chicago graduate, can you speak specifically to what um, univer the university has and can do? Yeah, uh, I, I definitely think uh, what Senator Duckworth is uh, advocating for and has advocated for uh, the last five years in Congress is is ideal and, and and what we're trying to get to right Im immigrant service members to become citizens um however in the meantime what we are seeing are that uh, a lot of these folks are falling through the cracks mm -hmm. and and something that would help them is to turn them into u.s nationals right from the beginning to protect them from e from the possibility of being removed uh, so, so I, I think that's a short-term solution that 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 a lot of folks on uh, be on both sides of the aisle can can get behind. Um, what what I think the university can do, um, especially with uh, its prestigious law school, is to begin some of these clinics that folks have been talking about with law students and begin a clinic to look at uh, deported veterans um, and their files and their cases and to see if there could be something done at the individual level, uh, at, the st at the state level, to see if folks can get repatriated like Hector and Miguel. Uh, so I think the University of Chicago Law School would be a great tool 
to help these folks that are already deported. Yeah. You know, the John Marshall Law School has a veterans legal assistance clinic. They mostly they mostly do work when it comes to um, helping veterans um, access their VA health care. But that's the kind of model that we need all around the country. And it's all pro bono and it's law students. It's actually an entire clinic run by um, uh, uh, several law professors that uses law students to do this work. Yeah. And I want to make sure to, to invite some of our service members into this conversation, too, for uh, Miguel, Carlos, Hector, like, what are your perspectives on what the community can do to help either through legislation or through more community participation in the Chicago area? Sure. Well, and, and, uh, one of the things that we've seen happen is uh, uh, locally, like in California and the, the states where there's a large immigrant communities, people are getting involved. So definitely reach out to your, your legislators. Uh, in the, the city of Los Angeles, we were able to get uh, the city to uh, not hand over immigrants over to uh, to uh, ICE where, when they're going through uh, through the uh, process. That way they, they do not get detained at some point. And then, um, but yeah, definitely reach out to the, 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 the law schools would be a great help. Uh, although we do have uh, the ACLU helping us out, it's very limited. Uh, and uh, we were able to get some state legislation passed as well to help some of the veterans. Uh, but it's also limited to uh, what kind of crimes you committed and if you have to have a California connection. So locally, no matter where you're from, you can uh, you can get involved. And uh, although there are states that do not give unconditional pardons, uh, there's different ways that we could attack this. Uh, but definitely U.S. nationality is, is very important. Uh, getting the universities involved. Not, not, the, the legal, the, the ones that work in the law aspect of it. And uh, just, you know, a simple sharing a Facebook page or uh, donating or getting involved is very important. Now we have virtual, uh, we can, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about is, is lobbying Congress through uh, through uh, a Zoom. You know, we don't have the money, we don't have the, uh, but we have the passion. So if people want to get involved, you can reach out to the local organization like Green Card Vets or reach out to the Port of Venice Support House. Thank you. You know, that makes me think I should organize a Zoom with my with some of my colleagues to talk to you guys. Because, yeah. yeah. no. you know, I, I can do a virtual Codell. I can't bring them with me there, but we should do a virtual Codell. That'd be amazing. Whoever, whoever on my team is on this call is probably both cringing and <laughs> writing this down right now. <laughs> we'll follow up. We'll follow up. No, thank you for that, Senator. I know that you'll make some good things happen, but. I really wanted to echo uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Um, there, in my experience over the last few years, there is a lot of uh, interest to help in the immigration law domain. Uh, however, before they can do anything to help bring them back or repatriate them, there's that criminal aspect to it. Now, it. I, I remember when we first started advocating to stop Miguel's deportation, I had somebody tell me like, Carlos, I get it. It's a it's a problem that shouldn't exist. But can't we find somebody with a DUI to advocate for instead? Mm -hmm. And how do I answer that? Right. I, I was floored. I said, no, you know, we th this is what we have. Right. We have this man who fought in Afghanistan twice uh, at a time when people were more concerned about who was going to war and why we were going to war than anybody coming back. And <laughs> I, I saw it really as mm -hmm. as as. Um, just immoral to not let this man benefit from what we've learned from people like him and his experiences. The only way, the only reason that veterans in you know 2015 had gotten to where they were was because of the 50 years of advocating that the Viet, uh, Vietnam veterans had done. And the only reason that we are where we are today with things like the Road Home Program, with Wounded Warriors, with all of these other national veteran organizations is because of all that we've learned about these invisible wounds over the last 20 years. And I think it's, it's only appropriate that we come together and really help these veterans who really need it. Uh, when, we, when I started the program at the county jail, I went to some uh, local nonprofit uh, and said, hey, would you be interested in helping? And most of the questions I got was, what kind of veteran were they? What kind of discharge? And what kind of crimes did they commit? And unfortunately, I couldn't answer all of those questions. Um, they were in a jail. They hadn't really been convicted of whatever crime yet. 
So that wasn't the case. And many of them just needed their DD-214 so that they can prove that they were a veteran and access some of these services. So that's what we found ourselves doing. And just that one simple action changed the lives of so many because now they had an official form of ID. Now they had that piece of paper that says, I am who I am. And this gives me access to some of these uh, benefits that are not accessible to others. So um, until we can really uh, have a serious discussion about what this trauma looks like in that person's time and in, in that person's life and acknowledge that, you know, as, as um, Alan Lynch, uh, Congressional Medal of Honor recipient and um, um, a, a huge ally for green card veterans, like he said, you know, once they put on that uniform, their cross is or their crime is our cross to bear. And I, I believe in that. You know, there I've met a lot of very good people that got caught for doing some bad things. And if they did not have um, the circumstances that they had, they probably would have never done. It. So I think that, um, uh, like he said, uh, universities that have the uh, intellectual capacity, the, the, the social capacity to be able to address these issues where they are. You know, unfortunately, what we did for Miguel and being able to advocate uh, for a clemency on his behalf here in Illinois is not something that we've been able to do in New Mexico, Nevada, California, um, for other veterans who needed that. So um, we, we really do need to take it a step back and address some of that post-conviction relief that many of these men and women need. Could you tell me about New Mexico? Is New Mexico a no, no, um, uh, no pardons state? Is that not a full pardon state or what's what well, we should follow up offline? I know the governor of New Mexico really well. Yeah, I believe she she has uh, issued a pardon recently. Uh, but now that uh, if, if I'm familiar with that case, uh, now that that veteran has his pardon there, now he has to uh, fight that battle at the federal level. Um, and, and so there's some intricacies there that I would love to talk to you about. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And in the last few minutes before we transition to the question and answer from our audience today, I want to go around with each one of our panelists and see if there's one message that you feel is most important to understand about this issue. What is the key thing that you want folks to take away who have been with us today? And I'll leave that to somebody to volunteer to start, and then I'll help move us around the panel since we're in this virtual space of boxes. It's a fundamentally unequal way that we serve, that we treat people who serve in an organization with the ultimate meritocracy. Like when you were in the military, how well you did, it was all a meritocracy, right? It was how, can you shoot straight? Will you, will you have the back of the guy and next to you? And yet we treat some of them differently. Yet they face the same dangers. They face this, they they were willing to lay down their lives in the same way as anybody else. And and it's it's fundamentally un-American, and it's fundamental to be this um, unequal in how we treat one soldier versus another soldier, or one airman, or you know one 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 troop versus another. When when we had them, when they served in you know when they serve in a, in the full completeness of their service was fully complete. If that that makes sense. Uh, and uh, just to reiterate, uh, Carlos made a, which is lines with the uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth said, we worry, we don't worry about how they join the military or in a sense, or when we draft them or you, we basically take them kind of as is, you know, and, but now when we want to return them home or when it's time for them get for them to get benefits, oh, wait a minute. Well, it's just, uh, the, can you find one with a DUI? You know, I mean, it shouldn't matter. You know, you put on the uniform, you served, uh, and if you paid your debt to society, then, then you shouldn't be deported. You shouldn't be deported. We shouldn't have to worry about what kind of crime you committed. And going back to what uh, uh, Alfredo said, U.S. nationality. They, 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 that if you, that's one of the things that if you uh, if you can uh, change as well in the in, in the Nationality Act, um, it can. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of crime you committed. You, and if you make it retroactive, all these guys would be U.S. nationals. So uh, just want to reintegrate that as well. <clears throat> um. Yes, I just want to follow up with that. Uh, I always believe that there's nothing more patriotic than going to war for your country. And uh, and most of us went to war for our country. We served proudly and we came back and we were dealt with this, uh, with this blow that nobody really expected, none of us. So it's, 
I want to say kind of shame in this country for letting this happen. And let's continue pushing to our, not only local, but that's all our elected officials uh, and continue pushing, make phone calls, letters, go out there and vote again when necessary. And let's just keep the fight because this is unpatriotic to deport a patriot. I like that. It's unpatriotic to deport a patriot. <laughs> that is a great slogan. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <Your new> hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, to, to to follow up, um, it, the U.S. undermines the citizen soldier tradition when it fails to incorporate immigrant service members as civil and political members. Um, and so, until we have a system that recognizes their service, we will be undermining the principles of the citizen soldier tradition. Thank you. I, I would say, um, you know, we're wrapping up Veterans Week um, and we often ask other veterans what being a veteran means. Uh, this year uh, was an answer different than I would have answered 10 years ago in terms of um, it really gives me a um, bittersweet feeling in that it's the one time of year where people are um, more vocal about their appreciation for veterans. Uh, but then after that, it fades away. And I, I just hope that people use this week and this day uh, to realize how poorly we have come to treat our countrymen and some of the countrymen that um, went off and uh, defended uh, our freedoms in different ways that other people are not willing to do. Uh, and to work for the rest of the year on um, raising some of the equity uh, and being able to make some of these um, uh, um, rights uh, wrong, some of these, excuse me, correct some of these wrongs that we've done. Well, thank you to all of our panelists for engaging in, in such a complex topic that, as we said in the beginning, this brings together immigration issues, um, the military, social services, mental health, the criminal justice system, so many layers. Um, at this point, I want to welcome back to the conversation um, John Hojek, who is a second year student at SSA and a U.S. Marine Corps veteran. And John's going to MC us through a question and answer session from our audience. So thank you, John. Thanks, Leo. Um, there's a couple questions. First, I just want to wish every uh, veteran a happy belated Veterans Day and thank you for your service. Um, so the first question is going to be uh, to Senator Duxworth. Um, why couldn't individual commands take the initiative to have an assigned military or civilian contractor assist with the proper paperwork as early as boot camp to get ahead of the process? Well, the individual commands could probably do it, but they don't, I mean, that they would have to choose actively to do that. And, and most of them uh, uh, will be hesitant to do that unless there's direction from higher headquarters, bottom line. And also it's a budgetary issue. So you're asking, you know, a, a unit commander who's got limited resources for personnel. I mean, he may have a bigger, uh, you know, budget for tanks, right? Or, 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 or ma deuces or, or, or deuce and a half, whatever it is. But, you know, that's a, that's one color of money, but the, but the color of money for administrative work, um, uh, he may not have that, uh, the resources for that. So we actually have to, and then, you know, so we, we have to really push down. And frankly, we don't want it done command by command. We don't want it to be done by ad hoc because remember that leadership moves out every two to four years. So you don't want like, okay, this year there happens to be a commander who supports this and he's doing it. And then he leaves and then there's nobody there for a while. You want this to be a DOD wide system. And you want this to have the, the, the force and the authority of a president backing it up and the secretary of defense. That's when it's going to be most effective. And then, then no one would drop through the cracks. Thank you for that. Um, another question directed uh, for you as well, Senator, um, and, I, and I believe uh, any any of the, the um, experts in the field can help here, but um, the question is, are there any figures or estimates as to how many veterans have been deported um, and how many are currently waiting to be repatriated? I would let one of the others uh, know. I mean, the problem is, see, they're deported all over the world and nobody, there's nobody's keeping track of these numbers. So you could have guys in Slovakia, you could have guys and gals in the Philippines and Thailand, wherever in, 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 
you know, in, in Liberia. And we just don't know. That's my understanding. There might be some rough numbers, but Carlos or Hector, do you have any idea? Sure. There, there's no numbers. Uh, the veterans have been deported uh, since 1996. That's over 20 years of deportation. Nobody's ever, the, uh, Senator Dacker wants to introduce some uh, uh, legislation where we track the veterans. We, we will never know how many veterans have been deported, but we can start the process. Uh, uh, and then there's there's different stories. Like I have a guy that's uh, from the uh, from uh, the former Russia, and they can't deport him. He's in New York. They can't deport him because Russia won't accept him. Well, well, the new guy, you know, they won't they won't accept him. To that country. It's weird. He's got a weird story. So there's a lot of different uh, situations with different people. I have a database of over uh, five no uh, around over 50 countries and around uh, over 400 people that are facing. Uh, deportation or going through the system and uh, but i don't even have the resources to update this database and this is something me and alfredo are uh, hopefully going to work on and but again we don't have the we don't have the funding and and we're trying to reach out to different universities to get, try to get that but it's uh we will never know but uh, let's let's start and uh, fix this uh, situation and that's what we're doing and we're continuing the conversation and uh, uh so yeah that's about you know just um I think the problem to answering that question is uh, what we saw at the Cook County Jail, and that is that uh, we're limited to people self-disclosing that 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 status. And so, what we did at the jail, for instance, uh, they were going, they were asking as part of the intake process if someone was a veteran. Well, we found that that excluded a lot of people who didn't consider themselves veterans, who uh, might have been from a different era, who might not have um, uh, thought of themselves as such for some other reason. So. We Right. So we asked. The, so we started asking them, have you ever served in our military, in, a, in the military? And, and that gave us a, uh, um, more uh, people who we found were eligible for the uh, community based services that were focused for veterans. And so, um, uh, like they said, there is no master list. We don't know who was deported. Actually, the uh, uh, um, the publication that came out uh, in June of 2018 um, actually concluded that because of the mishandling of, of, of files between ICE and USCIS, we really don't know how many veterans. So uh, all of that to say that we don't know, and it's going to be uh, a huge outreach effort if we ever really wanted to get to know that. Thank you all for, for answering that. Um, to Miguel and Hector, um, there's a question, uh, and this was kind of already brought up when you mentioned the FMP, um, but if you sought services from the VA while deported, could you describe what your experience was while trying to access those services and benefits and any barriers you found to be able to receive them? Uh, well, fortunately for my case, um, I started the process with the VA uh, before I got deported. So that was a plus that other deported veterans uh, don't have. And But as once I got deported, I had no access to anything with the VA. I was, uh, I was left alone with 13 days uh, of my prescription. Uh, they gave me 13 days full of my, uh, my medicine and just dropped me off in the border and have a good life. And there was no way for me to get the medicine or any medical services through the VA. Uh, luckily, we found uh, there's a Dr. Rudy Nelson that deals with the benefits, and he travels around the world helping uh, some of the deported veterans and all veterans alike. But if it, it was thanks to him and to Carlos Luna that kept advocating for me here, also with uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth, my church, my people. You know, fortunately, I come from Chicago, where my church and my fellow veterans were able to help my family, and I access some of the things that I needed to keep me afloat. But uh, as far as other veterans in Tijuana, there were many of them. They had the same experiences as me up to getting deported, but they did not have, you know, the, like I said, the Pastor Emma's, the attorney Chris Bergen, Green Car Veterans, Carlos, Senator Tammy Duckworth uh, at the time. So I was lucky enough to get that type of support. But as far as uh, dealing with anything health, no, not at all. And uh, it was it was horrific just to be left like that. Uh, we accessed the, with Dr. Rudy Nelson just to provide benefits, financial benefits, but as far as uh, medical, no, not at all. Hector? Um, basically, same thing. There's a, there's a lack in, uh, in, in, in uh, 
to access because of the, the way the FMP set up. And uh, Dr. Rudy Nelson has some suggestions of how we could change some of this. If we could, and then I'll follow up with uh, Senator Duckworth on this. But uh, you know what? Recently, I, I came into contact with something with somebody with COVID. And uh, my ignorance, uh, I called my aunt. Aunt, uh, Tia, you need to get your uh, your COVID. And l later on, I found out when I tried to get a, get one in Mexico that it's like 4,000, 5,000 pesos. And it's that's like almost two months wages worth of, you know, of, of uh, you know, of what you make over there. And uh, so there is, I mean, it, as it is, the country that you might be deported to might have very, very limited resources, but we don't have any access to that. Again, the, the, the FMP is very limited. Uh, we need to change that. And uh, I'll follow up with uh, uh, Senator Duckworth to see if there's anything we can do that and get, maybe get a conversation going with Dr. Nelson. Mm -hmm. Thank you for answering that. Um, my uh, next question is for um, Alfredo. I'm doing uh, research on immigration policy and reformation. Um, what do you wish to see with immigrants who join the military as in policy to benefit them? So po policy that would benefit uh, immigrants in the military uh, are, I, I think revolve around the recruiters themselves and the information that's given to these enlistees and and that they know that when they're enlisting into the military that they're enlisting in uh segregated occupations because they lack that legal citizenship so so i think it's very important for these young people to know that when they're enlisting that their advancement and how they serve the country is very particular as opposed to their colleagues right and and i think that starts at the recruiting at the recruiting level. Yeah, but we can we can solve a lot of that by just giving them a green card status as soon as they complete basic training. And at basic training, we also, you know, you go through a thousand classes in basic training. Mm -hmm. And when, when you get through, and one of those classes, one of those days should be they take you into a room and they give you a language test. And what that that then gives you another skill identifier. Once you take that language test, now you have a, a, a legal permanent resident green card, and you have a skill, a specialized skill designator next to your name, which now benefits the military and benefits the country even more so. And you also get extra pay for get for that. And then, of course, give you your citizenship status once you know when when you get your DD two fourteen at the end of your tour of duty, and you're you're about to head out the door. You don't head out the door unless until you get sworn in as a citizen. De definitely, uh, Senator Duckworth. Uh, but but I, I think you're referring to uh, DACA members, right? Because no, you no, have no, no. My bill, my bill, Enlist Act is a pathway for citizenship. Mm -hmm. My bill okay. actually says as soon as you enlist, you get a green card, mm -hmm. and then if you do one complete tour of duty, uh, uh, you know, honorably, you get citizenship. That's the bill that I've introduced called the Enlist Act. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, but but uh, I, what what I think I'm highlighting is is the fact that uh, as an immigrant, you can't join specific occupation. You can't join special forces. You can't join intelligence. You can't be a radio operator, right? You you serve in either combat or combat support because of the lack of citizenship. So although folks uh, would get citizenship at the end, that doesn't do anything for them while they're serving. Right. And so and so it would help them for their yeah, second tour. They would, they would after your first tour, then you would have status and then you can go to any anywhere else for your second tour. But it would be a pathway. Definitely. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Green card status. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for, for uh, adding um, your insight to that. Um, Senator Duxworth, um, at this time, I would just like to ask if there's anything that you would like to add to, to this discussion. Well, just that, you know, for, we just came off an election cycle. I think that it's important for folks to advocate for these causes with your local electeds. Make this an issue they have to talk about and make it real. And so, um, and you can see in this latest election, the rise in particular of the Latinx community in elections. You saw what happened in, in Florida and Texas and Arizona and New Mexico in particular. Um, and so there is additional power within the community. And we are going into a, a re-election in Georgia you know, a, 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 a runoff in two races. Understand the political 
environment that we are in and understand that there is power to be had in that environment for those of you who are advocating for this. And you need to talk to people in your extended network to let Marco Rubio know, to let you know all of these folks know, hey, this is an important issue and you better be supporting this. You say you support our veterans and our military men and women and you support the Latinx community. Same with the AAPI community as well. Thank you, Senator. Um, at this time, I would like to uh, reintroduce uh, Bridget Collier. Thank you. On behalf of the University of Chicago, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude uh, to this distinguished panel of veterans who now serve our country today as our policymakers, as academics, and as advocates for our veterans. Uh, a special thank you to the Honorable Senator Tammy Duckworth for her ongoing commitment to our veterans. Thank you for participating in today's panel discussion. Uh, thank you to Carlos Luna, uh, to Dr. Alfredo Gonzalez, Miguel Perez, and Hector Barajas uh, for your participation. Thank you to Professor Leora Hudak for today's uh, discourse and uh, for facilitating, and to John Hojak for serving as our MC. Um, I'd also like to say a special word of thank you to Terrell Odom, who organized our event today uh, for the events of this past week, our Vets Week at the university. Uh, Terrell has a deep commitment and, and works tirelessly to serve our military affiliated community at the university uh, in the city of Chicago and across our nation. Um, and then I'd like to thank my provost, uh, Provost Lee, for her commitment to recruiting veterans and supporting our veteran scholars at the university. And then finally, to conclude the University of Chicago's Vets Week, I want to thank all of the individuals who have served in the military on behalf of our great nation and the military families that have supported them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, everybody. The recording has stopped.